Today's guest is so amazing. Katie McBratney is next level. They are the co-founder and chief brand officer at OwnTrail, the platform where women visualize and navigate their paths through life, taking moments intentionally to celebrate those non-traditional twists and turns. Katie is obsessed with disrupting the status bro, and they talk all about it in this episode. Katie is a strategist, an artist, a social scientist, and they are a borderline book hoarder based in Atlanta. Katie and I nerd out on so many things together. In particular, we talk about the fact that we are conditioned to think and operate in a binary world when really we're intended to live within a spectrum. We talk about the dynamics of masculinity and femininity and how that whole spectrum unfortunately has been polarized in such a way that we lose so much of the magic that each and every one of us holds within it. So we talk about the fact that it is kind of cool to be able to step into our identities and reject that binary way of thinking. We also talk a lot about mental health, mental wellness, and how important it is for us to create spaces where our ability to witness one another and to watch ourselves evolve and still have love and care and value each other is so important, especially at this time right now where there is so much evolution, change, and self-awareness happening for each and every one of us. The levels of uncertainty are such a wonderful invitation for curiosity. And Katie talks all about how important it's been to be able to embrace the curiosity in their life and also the many iterations and the many many twists and turns on, on their journey. If you're a parent, we talk a lot about how important it is to create a space for your children to be able to understand and embrace their identity and feel that love no matter how they identify. We also talk about the bro culture in tech and the tech startup space, also in the investment management and VC space. So if you are somebody that is curious about how to raise money, how to do fundraising in this current state of venture capital where only a very small percentage of venture capital dollars are going to non-dominant identity founders, this episode is for you. We also talk in depth about how Katie and their co-founder, Rebecca, who was just on a recent episode, think about managing a team and creating a business very intentionally focused on being inclusive and bucking the oppressive systems and structures that we have been marinating in for generations. I could tell you everything about this episode, but I want you to meet Katie and I want you to get to know all about the amazing magic that they bring into this world. Without further ado, here's my new friend, Katie. Welcome to Checkbox Other, Katie. I'm so excited you're here. And for those of you that aren't able to just listen in to the pre-recorded parts of this, we've been talking for a really long time. So I am just so excited that we get to now bring you all into this wonderful conversation. Katie and I, we were just jamming on so many things in like it, we, that resonated on so many levels. And I know you all are just going to love everything about her story and this conversation, <laughs> not to, uh, to, to set us up with too much of an expectation, but I already know we're going to blow it out of the water. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's already been so fun chatting and I'm sure that, that, uh, the electricity in the convo will only continue from here. Like, yeah, I know I should put a fan on myself at this point. Um, all right. So the first thing I have people do when they come on here is to give what I call a cliff notes version of your story, the twists, turns, the aha moments you choose. It doesn't need to be standard bio, which I know with own trail is, uh, I feel like so in alignment with how we think about how we identify ourselves and how we talk about our journeys. And so I'd love to hear the cliff notes version of Katie's story. Awesome. So hello, everyone. I am Katie McRappy, she, they, and I am, I, I say my life's work and not just what I do for a living is and always has been disrupting the status bro. Um, I'm a former marketer who never felt fully uh, comfortable in that role, even though I had all the trappings and uh, accolades to to show that I quote unquote belonged. Um, I am the co-founder and COO of Own Trail, which is the platform to visualize and navigate your life paths. I'm also a strategist, an artist, a social philosopher, a parent, 
um, and a shit starter in lots of different ways. Um, and for fun, I like to read all of the things ever. That has been like a foundational piece of my journey is really opening up the possibilities in front of me. Um, a respite for when I felt othered, inspiration, instruction. Um, so books are at the absolute core of so many things. Uh, and sometimes for fun, I like to go on Twitter and do Muppet astrology readings because we all could use more silliness in our lives. What? Okay, well, I will be doing a duet <laughs> on your Twitter for the Muppet astrology readings because that's amazing. I hear Kermit the Frog in the back of my head. Um, oh, you definitely, I feel like you have a Kermit moon. Your Kermit moon. For sure. I'm here for it. I am here for it. Patrick Mahomes got the Kermit voice to him too. And so like, it makes me love Patrick Mahomes even more. Uh, so. as, a, as a Kansas City native, I, uh, I will, I will second, I will endorse and fully second that, that. Uh, oh, didn't even know. Didn't even know that. Look at that. My goodness. The synchronicity here. It's just I, fun. I mean, next level. Well, there's, let me just say, there are so many things about your cliff notes that I'm like, wait a second, I didn't know that. I want to learn about that. I want to learn about that. But the first thing I want to do is hold some space. I want to hear about a time that you felt other, which I feel like you just gave a couple in the, in the intro anyway. And if there are more than one there, I mean, that's, this is the stuff I will jam on all day, but I would love to hear a time when you felt other in your life and kind of how it's informed your journey up till this point. Ooh, as, as you pointed out, there's been many times that I've felt othered throughout my life. And, um, you know, as a white person, like, I don't think everybody would necessarily expect that. And there've been lots of times where I've sat at the absolute apex, apex of privilege and being the, on paper, the prototype, right? Um, I'd say probably my first real formative memory of being othered is when I was experiencing and diagnosed with major depressive disorder when I was 14, 14. And um, that not being something that this was the, this was the mid nineties. And even though there was talk back then about reducing mental health stigma, all of that, it was very much stuff that was in pamphlets. You guys, yeah. this was before the internet. So we had like brochures, right? And like pamphlets. Um, and really being the, the only one in my friend group, both close friend group and extended friend group that was going through something like that. And um, not and having a varied reaction from all the people around me, especially my peers. So some friends who were very supportive, who were very empathetic, who were holding space, even though none of us had the language for, for so much of what was going on. And then friends who tried their best and made well-intentioned, missteps and then friends who had no idea how to handle, how to approach, how to discuss any of it, who distanced or um, had negative reactions to what was very much a medical uh, experience. And for me, that was, that was very formative in being like, oh, I can experience the events and facts of my life, but the interpretation and the reactions to that and some of the responses to that, I don't have control over. And some of those responses and reactions fucking suck. And some are amazing. And sometimes being othered could feel great. Like I'm different in this way and my friends know me deeper and can communicate with me better and our relationships have grown. And other times it was more like a, like a dividing line. You know, I, I think of the brochure timeline. We'll use that as, as our, our timeline anchoring point of just how narrow the conversation, if there was a conversation around mental health at all, um, and also the taboo that came across the board with regard to just even having a discussion about somebody's, you know, brain working different, um, differently. And, you know, it makes me even think about, we're talking about brochure culture before the internet or before WebMD was a place that you went to, to supposedly get informed information. Um, but also we're still in a place where there is so much, I, I guess misinformation might be part of it, but there's just so much 
of the taboo that still exists, even though millennials are supposed to be the therapy culture, even though, you know, there is supposed to be this normalized experience of seeing and understanding and creating space for people to have different um, experiences with their mental wellness. And yeah, I, I, it is such a fascinating thing that we tend to get a lot of information from adults, but even as children, we are teenagers, whatever, if you don't consider yourself a child and you're a teenager, um, how that learned projection um, and also the ability to really tap into your empathy can show up so significantly. And the wisdom of teenage you to be like, well, I don't have control over how anybody's gonna react or respond to this. So here's where I'm gonna kind of anchor my experience and get the most that I can. Also acknowledging the fact that this feels like absolute shit when there are people that I loved and cared about that can't, can't see through this, can't work through this, can't stop you know their own experiences from flooding into mine. And so I just thank you for sharing that. And also I feel like in sharing that in living as you live, like that is just crumbling more of that kind of taboo and that kind of barrier between us because each, at least how I feel about this stuff, whether you've been diagnosed one way or another, you have some relationship with your mental health that deserves space, deserves care and deserves people around you that can like kind of honor the fact that you are different than they are. Um, so I'm just like, I feel like, I feel like I say this a lot, especially when people are sharing their other stories from when they're younger. I'm like, I feel like teenage me and teenage you should have really hung out. We would have had a great time. <laughs> I very much believe that. I very yeah. much believe that. Oh time goodness. machine. <laughs> Could we go yeah. back and watch my so-called life? That's what I'd like to do. Yes, yes. Great. Yes, please. Yeah. Have some doc, Dr. Pepper lip smackers, maybe paint her nails black. Uh, well, I have, oh God, I could, yes. All the things I will tell you, I wanted so badly, like, and I didn't even do this, so I don't know why I share this, but maybe this is me speaking it into existence for the next season. I really, really wanted to channel that time in my life where like uh, overalls were all day, every day with the coolest thing ever. And I, uh, I haven't really been able to bring that back into my life, but it makes me feel as though I can be back in this space of like that lip smacker, that like all the lip smacker flavors that you were collecting, all the things that, you know, I was so cool with like all these, all these things that now you look back and you're like, oh, well, that's what adolescence, that's what adolescence looked like then. Now it looks like, you know, you're an Instagram influencer, yes. but yeah, my hot messness was on full display and I didn't even know. I thought it was cool. And you know what? I learned so much from it. So thank you. deserve you. overall life as an adult. It's funny. I almost put on overalls today. And I will say that like embracing wearing overalls again and starting in my mid thirties, I was like, why did I ever stop? Like, when did we start I, this whole thing about, about fashion and style and signs and signifiers, but this whole idea about fashion being a way to express and a way to have fun, like we take ourselves too serious a lot of times. Like we're covering our meat sacks with, with fabric. Like we might as well find something that brings us joy and is comfortable. And um, if it doesn't, don't buy it, don't wear it. Yes, oh my goodness. You know, I, I this fall, I went to Portugal for about six weeks and it was one of the things that was so fascinating to me was being in a space where just the way that you looked at other people culturally was very different. And so as you're talking about us in our meat sacks and how people are kind of processing and categorizing each other based on what they can see, uh, it was so interesting because in Portugal, I don't really know the full on history. I mean, there's, there's a significant amount of um, racial history for sure. There's a significant amount of like uh, em empire dynamics. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of the discovery, uh, dis discoverers? Is that what I want to say? Christopher Columbus. I like it. What is that? I like okay. it. People that went and discovered around the world, you know, there's a lot of kind of, of the basis in that part of the world, but, and also there was such a different experience with people just letting you exist as you were. And it didn't feel like I was under the eye of anybody. It didn't look, <laughs> that was such a handmade Tale reference that I didn't even intend. Um, but it was like this very, out of body experience, if I'm honest, I'm so used to having people like look at you and approve you one way or another, whether you know that that's your everyday dynamics So to walk down the street and people just be like, yeah, you do your own thing, be in your own lane, wear what you want, be what you want, show up as you want. And it's okay here, um, was fascinating. Like, 
I wish every, and you know, part of, you know, everyone should have some sort of experience outside of their comfort zone for sure. But being in a space that removed what I think is baked into just the baseline level of functioning here in America was, and I've, I've been to France, I've been around the world for some reason, this was such a different experience of just being able to show up in my overall version, loving self, whatever I wanted to do that day was perfectly fine. And so it's just so, um, it would be such a wonderful opportunity to be able to maybe give ourselves after a snap of finger that for like a week and see how it feels if we want to keep doing it. <laughs> yes. The burden of presentation pressure is so real. And I think there's a lot of conversation. Well, we know that there's a lot of conversation and discussion and a fair amount of even academic research into how that plays out in online spaces, in social media, for sure. And also, I think sometimes we forget how it plays out in person. Even if we aren't, you know, even in the past two years when we've been in various degrees of isolation and lockdown, you're still around your physical, you're still around your physical body. Other people are seeing representations of your physical body. And I think that this, we can't forget that that presentation pressure has different forms in both places, but is pretty persistent in, the, in our American culture, especially for anyone who's ever experienced life or, or presented as female, right? There's all of these different boxes that you're supposed to fit in. You're supposed to be pretty, but not too sexy. You're supposed to be strong, but not too strong. You're supposed to be different looking enough, but you can't be too different, right? Yes. There's all these different norms that we're supposed to, to thread the needle in, in terms of even just appearances. And I can't imagine like how lovely that must have, how lovely and also new that might've felt to be outside of in that way. What, yeah. a, what, a, what an adventure. I, it, I'm, we're going back. I, well, I'm going back with family this time. Um, and it was funny. I'm like, that's the part that I'm so excited. Everyone's like, Oh, what are you excited to do? What are you going to do different? I'm going to be a little bit more touristy this time. Sure. But I'm like, I just want to be marinating in a different space. Um, and so, yeah, so freaking excited. And I feel mm. like I'm just so excited because I feel like the question that I have for you was, is about this idea of not feeling like we have to be in that box or check one of those boxes. And again, check box, oh, yes, yes, yes. But in uh, my, the TED talk that I did that came out right, like I did a month after I started this podcast, I started it very intentionally by creating like actual slides with two boxes you can check. You can either check that you're a night owl or an early bird. You can check that you are a leader or a follower. And I even, cause it was here in Boston, it was like, you're a Yankees fan or a Red Sox fan. You know, like it was all of this, like very much like on a binary structure, the ones and zeros, you can do one thing or the other, you can't be in the middle. And obviously well, at least my point of it was, could we actually exist outside of those boxes? And so one of my, as I, for those of you who haven't listened to our earlier interview with um, Rebecca, Katie's co-founder, um, we talked so much about their wonderful company, Own Trail. And on Own Trail, there are milestones along your journey. And Katie, on your journey, your milestone about rejecting the binary, I thought was so beautiful because it was just so like, yeah, this is how we do things. So I would love to hear your kind of your experience of navigating this binary world um, and, and how kind of that moments slash that mo milestone, whether it's one moment or, or more so, uh, presented itself for you? Yeah, I think this, this, the, the pressure and the tension between in a binary world in so many ways has always unsettled me. I've never felt very comfortable um, picking absolutes, right? There are certain things we know to be true and yes, 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 all of that. You know, I can feel very strongly about certain things and also, um, I very much have, have lived in this like yes and mentality before, again, before I really knew the words for that. Um, and knowing that I was often checking multiple boxes or not really feeling like I could check any of them in, in different, even just interests, which I love those examples, right? Like Yankees or Red Sox, like literally, why do you have to choose one? Why, right? Because that's the way fandom works, but why? And so I think that this curiosity and this questioning and, and following what felt true to me about like, why can't things be more than one? Because they can't, that's not a reason. Um, why do I have to choose one? What if one of these options doesn't feel right? And so 
the concept of rejecting the binary has really been with me since the very beginning, annoying my parents with asking lots of questions. Like they could never get away with like, because I said so. Yep. <laughs> I would be like, but that's not an answer. Like, yes, you could want me to go to bed and I need sleep. And also I want to read this book. Like how can these two things can be true at once. And as I, as I really done a lot of self-work over the years and learning and educating myself more about gender as a social construct and the difference between bi biology and sex and, and never quite feeling like the cultural stereotypes of what it meant to be a woman um, applied to me in the sense of like, I wasn't into pink, you know, all those, I don't know if there are any listeners or if you like were, were a girl who was like, I don't want pink. Pink's my least favorite color. Like, I don't want girly things, right? Because it was so shoved down our throats that it was your, your girl, if you like this, and otherwise you're a tomboy or you're whatever. And I was like, I don't know. Can I just like the things I like without a label? I felt that way in most ways of my life. Like, why do we need to associate labels? Labels can be useful. Our brains as humans need to categorize. It's how we process the world. And some of the labels have been created and cultivated in such a way to remove power, to limit opportunity, um, and in many, many cases to actually like physically and legally oppress and harm people. And um, as I just went along this journey, I was like, I don't feel like man or woman are real terms. Um, there's definitely biolog biological sexes and things like that, but I was like, I don't know. I don't believe that 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 gender is a binary. Uh, and in believing that, you know, I was like, oh, well, obviously that means I'm non-binary then. Like it was just kind of like, it wasn't like this coming out moment. It wasn't like a big change in how I live my life. Yeah. Um, it was just being like, well, of course, everyone knows I don't believe in the binary nature of uh, that gender is binary. I don't believe in the binary nature of a lot of things. So this just felt like the logical next step that aligned with the language that we have now yeah. and with the work, especially by trans and non-gender conforming and non-binary people of color, the work that they, the work and the sacrifices that they've done to be able to have this conversation and have this language reach the point it's at. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the experience of how we process so much of the identity discoveries as a collective we've been having on a larger you know, societal level have really been fueled by so much sensationalization, so much of this like big reveal, aha moment, I'm coming out, I hope, you know, all of this anxiety and all of this just, <laughs> this experience that it needs to be something that is a make or break in your existence and your worth and your viability as a person. and. Um, not to say that that is not an experience that people have, because again, we, we live in a society that creates these kind of culmination points of like, okay, am I going to, am I allowed to be who I am? And do I have to declare it in order for it to be viable? But also the idea that we can, we can have this space and this understanding with ourselves that allows us to just show up and be like, this is who I am. And this is how I operate. This is what I believe. You don't have to come in and be indoctrinated by the things that I believe in that I say and how I see myself. It is exactly how I am living in this body, in this meat sack I love that you said that, at this point in time in my life. And I think it is important for us to actually be able to embrace who we are. So often we've been told to put on a mask, put on a costume and play a part. And the ability to just be like, I don't need, this doesn't need to be some huge, big, dramatic reveal. And also it is just as important to me to be able to stand in my space and my identity as the human being that I am. And I've known I have been since, you know, since the jump. And often that comes with a rejection feeling too. I feel like the whole, I'm not going to wear pink. Like I very much felt that as a kid, that like, you can't tell me because of any aspect of how I was, how I present in the world that I am something you don't know me. Um, but it is, it was such a normalized thing to be like, I hate pink. I like sports. Um, and I want to hang out with the guys. I play soccer with the guys. I do all this stuff. So I can't like anything that's feminine. 
Um, and there was such a, that, that kind of, again, the binary of masculinity and femininity mm-hmm. in our culture is so, and it's like, even, I don't know if you've been seeing this, there's these posts about like, even the onesies that kids are given before, you know, before they're verbal, before, the, you know, that are really just shoving gender norms down, heter- heterosexual gender norms down people's throats. Yeah. And, and as a parent, right, like I, I want and I work and I aspire to be the kind of parent who accepts my child no matter what and lets them know from the jump that that their path is theirs to carve out whoever they are I love them I love them exactly how they are and how they view themselves how they understand their identity might change over time and great like I'm ride or die with you on this journey babe uh uh, and it really highlighted to me the the disparities in how like you said nonverbal sometimes even like fetuses are treated right like this idea that you're a ladies man or you're like daddy's little girl and and to me I think that that's really taking away agency um and that's what always to your point about like rejecting girly culture right that felt like it was our only choice because everything else was was really shoved down our throats about what it meant to be a girl or to be assigned female at birth it was kind of like this is this is your lane stay in it where the sparkles pick your Disney princess, here you go. Starter pack, right? And I'm still at 39, unpacking a lot of the internalized misogyny that came with being a girl and a young woman who felt like the only path to freedom, to self-expression was to be one of the guys. And I'm really happy that I'm at this, this point in my life. And also I'm like, oh, look, I look back at hindsight and I see young Katie and I'm like, oh, I see what you were trying to do there. Yeah, there's a better way. And I know that I'm where I am now because of that, but I'm just like, oh yeah, those whiskey drinking, like talking sports with the guys, you know, saying I had no friends who were, who, you know, I, I can't be friends with girls like that. It was all a lot of nonsense, but it was my way of having a choice in a society that was trying to force me down one archetype of identity. And Spoiler. Like- you can yes. be you, just be you. Please, please, everybody listening. I know if you're here, you probably are working towards that or believing that each and every day. However, this, we're both here to say, yes, it's important for you. You are here to be who you are. It is, please. yeah, it is like vital for each and every one of us to be able to stand in our space because it actually gives us each permission to do the same. Oh, I, I love it. Oh, I mean, I could, I could talk about this all day. It's so funny. I think that the looking back and and the, I don't know if it's survival mechanism of it all or the, you know, agency creating version of yourself that was like, oh, that's why I did that. That's why I felt that way. That's why I said that thing that I actually didn't necessarily believe. Or that's why I minimized a part of myself because I wanted to make sure that you didn't take something away from me that was mine. The worth that I was born into this world with that I watched and saw how you were degrading the worth of other people who had the same presentation as I do and if I take that away from you having the opportunity to value and assess me then that gives me a little bit more power and control back again not realizing at the time how the (laughs) the balance between futility at the collective level of social conditioning and also the ultimate feeling of perfectionist control as the individual to feel like I need to be able to fix all the things around me so that, you know, it's, it's in my control, but also it's not, I can't do anything about it. And kind of doing that dance between the two to find where actually you exist between those two things. And the fact that in life, we're going to swing between all of those things and it's okay. But as a kid, we are given like very, con- I mean, there's a reason we learn very concrete things at a younger age and then blend in the nuance as we go. And for some folks that that stops at a certain point uh, where we're not able to have kind of critical thought, but um, the idea that we can discern for ourselves as we get to know ourselves more. And I love when you were talking about parenting that like your, your relationship with your identity can evolve and that doesn't dictate how much I love you, how much I accept you, or how val- valuable and viable you are to contribute as yourself in this world. So I just, there's so much. I feel like, again, it's one of those things I'm like, can we flip the switch and have all parents really just like thinking about their children that way? Because it would be a much more healed <laughs> place. The generational trauma that's being passed down in, in microaggressions all day around that stuff would be so wonderful to kind of just relieve ourselves of the weight of it. 
I think I think so much of parenting is actually looking at, at what you've inherited, not just intergenerational trauma, but what pieces of your childhood, be it your parents or other situations or circumstances, like what pieces are you trying to actively prevent for your child? And in what ways are you conditioning them in a different way? You know, as parents, we're gonna mess up. Like we're gonna, we're going to mess up and we're going to embarrass our kids. Like that's just a fact. Um, and it, so for me, I'm just thinking about who I'm serving with different actions and behaviors and also extending grace to myself when I'm like, oh my God, I sounded just like my mom, which is not a bad thing, by the way. No, yeah. hey, hey mom, if you're listening. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But when I'm like, oh, I sounded just like my mom, why does that bother me? Is that my shit I need to work through? Am I doing this because it's serving me? It's making me feel better in a moment of frustration? Or am I being empathetic for this person who's literally learning how the world works right now? And so um, I think that that extends to how we interact with other humans, like other adults, other grown humans, right? Kids are humans, obviously. Um, and this idea of being like, oh, wait, is my reaction about you or is my reaction about me? Or is my reaction about neither of us? Okay, cool. Let's move on from that point. Yeah, let's... You know, one of the things that uh, I really enjoyed, uh, I'm trying to remember, maybe it was Rising Strong, Brene Brown's book. I'm trying to remember which one it was, but where she talks about the fact that oftentimes in conflict with regard to social work, um, we're taught to look at each other like we're on opposite sides of the table. And, you know, Zoom specifically lately has made it, us feel like we're not sitting next to each other because we're two dimensionally facing each other the whole time. But the idea when there is disagreement, conflict, confusion, um, is instead of pitting against one another to actually move to the same side of the table and have the problem or the disagreement or the, the area of confusion be on the other side so you can work together to kind of unravel the knot. And it is something that it, I think, again, it takes a level of comfort in yourself, a level of self-awareness, but also the, the ability to like swim in the uncertainty and not know and maybe be wrong and maybe cause pain, unintentionally causing pain, um, or doing things that like seemingly seem very intentional, but they're learned and the ability to be like, okay, I'm actually not trying to do that. How can we work together to overcome this? Even if we're not on this, we don't feel like we're on the same team because we've been taught that we need to be on opposite teams if we don't agree on something. Um, it is just such a beautiful thing to think about really just instilling the ability to actually live in the in-between and the comfort of the in-between and shift and change and evolve as you go. I mean, the, hu the human beings that we are, we are, we are built for the ability to have that nuance and that critical thought. That's why our brains are the way they are. That's why we are the beings that we are in this world. Children, adolescents, adults, all of us have these brains that are evolving or changing in one way or another. Um, and it is just so, I think, so powerful and important to create the space that I know you were just talking about creating for a child, but also I feel like in own trail, creating the space for each and every one of us to be like, here's the charted path that I've gone on and here are the things I want to share, but also that might change, that might pivot. Um, and how important it is to really honor each and every milestone on that journey, whether it is socially seen as a really important moment, that it is an important moment for each and every one of us to, you know, chart our path forward. So I'd love to hear a little bit about how, how you have kind of seen this idea of disrupting what I know you call disrupting the status bro, how you've seen that play out as you're creating spaces for us to do that, as you're encouraging spaces for us to really be like, okay, this is, you know, as you were saying, is this us? Is it the two of us or is it the world around us? How has that kind of shown up um, both in your own journey, but also specifically in creating space for uh, Own Trail to be intentionally uh, charting a new path forward. It's funny, when you, when you talk about um, the, the relationship to our journey and how things change over time, I tell people, and this is very true, that I've probably had 18 different versions of my trail, my journey on Own Trail yeah. over the past two plus years. And I say that as an example of how self awareness and ongoing reflection can be helpful, uh, can be one of many, many available tools that help you navigate where you're going next and really who you are, your understanding of your place in the world and what you have control over and what you don't. And some people might interpret having 18 versions of my journey through life 
being a sign of uncertainty. And it, my experience is that it's absolutely the opposite. The facts of our lives remain the same, right? If we look at when we graduated college and what that degree was in, um, where we grew up, our relationships with our parents, financial circumstances, our first job, those are facts. How we feel about those, how we understand those, how we process those, and those the relevance of those to our life today changes and should change. As we have, you know, the, the, the whole adage about hindsight being 2020, I think is an oversimplification, but is it really a valuable and a accessible understanding of the value of, of own trail and creating spaces for people to have ongoing relationships with their own journey? Because it isn't that you see everything perfectly looking back. It's that you're applying the knowledge, the language, the circumstances of now to things that have been formative to you. And from there, you can say, what am I doing with those tools? How am I healing? How am I fueling my strength? What am I doing? Um, and I don't think, well, I certainly, no, I will even say, I know I wouldn't be here on this journey with the own trail for so many reasons, but part of it is because of the formative experiences I had working in tech working in corporate environments, working in the ad agency life, very much in hustle culture and seeing how extraction focused those are as capitalist, as typically patriarchal and, and certainly as white centered spaces and industries. Um, it's all about monetizing. It's all about users. It's not about people. And I learned some really hard lessons participating in those kind of products, in those kind of cultures, and in knowing that it never felt right to me. So in building a highly successful tech startup, the intention from the beginning was to do it differently because the way that it's working now is only working for some people at the expense of others. And so I like to tell people that on trail in a way is an antidote to mainstream social media that is taking our personal information and in the best case, cramming our eyeballs full of ads based on that. And in the worst case, pulling apart the fabric of democracy, of unity, of uh, what you talked about, of sitting at the same side of the table to talk through differences and disagreements and to collectively better our understanding. Um, they're focused on independence and individualism not collectivism and interdependence. And that's, ask any biologist, which I am not, that's the way the world works. We're all connected. You, one ecosystem tumbles, they're all crumbling down, baby. And we can't pretend as human beings that we are immune to that. And it's time we just build that way, build in the way that's actually, I believe, natural for us, instead of the way we've been told is the way to be successful. And so we do that by being human first at Own Trail. Um, when my co-founder Rebecca and I were in talks about me coming aboard as a co-founder, I came on, I was like, okay, we jumped into this relationship being honest and authentic. Here are my deal breakers. And like, if these are the businesses you wanna build, like good, good for you, but I'm out respectfully. Spoiler, obviously we were aligned and here we are. Um, but we've continued that. And we, we, we start Own Trail events with our community um, our trail guides program, our, our, paid pro, our paid membership, and also our team meetings often with the simple but powerful question of who and how are you today? Because we need to connect as humans first and operate from there. Because if somebody's spiraling and stressing out because they just received bad news from a family member or like their daycare shut from COVID, shut down from COVID again, or like they're so over the moon because like their book is about to get released. Like, that's great. We need to understand where we're each operating from and just spending a moment to like start from there. Then we can handle business. Like the business part can be doing massive air quotes here. Easy. The hard work is, is being people first, building things for people because it's what we've been taught not to do. My heart is like singing right now. I went to a school that is primarily a business school for undergrad. 
and I should say just for college, I did not go to graduate school. I feel like a lot of times when people say undergrad, they're like, and then, or maybe that's just a Massachusetts thing where they say they went to school in, in Cambridge. And you're like, mm. so you're telling me you went to Harvard? Okay, great. Um, but I, you know, it's such an interesting experience. To, and also there's so much of me that's like, yes, my people. I left the halls that you were talking about, the kind of the bro culture halls. I talk, I talk about it as mahogany walls and, you know, business, formal business, casual, and really just like me putting on the pants suit vibe to be as least amount to cover up all of my curves as much as possible and not be too, too much of the, you know, temptation of Eve that nobody can seem to handle in the workplace, you know, and the, the interesting part on, you know, I'm coming on six years of this business and there's so many people that I've known that have created businesses and have been more quote unquote, traditionally successful by kind of latching into the paths and the processes that we're told to be successful in that kind of extracting culture you're talking about in that very like hyper-capitalism um, the transactional nature of things. And it is to be able to kind of stand in the, in the, I don't know if the fire is the, maybe that's what's coming up of being like, you know, I'm not going to take that route. Like, yes, you're giving me five steps to whatever version of metric of success is where I'm supposed to want to be, or trying to get this type of funding or get approval from this type of person, or, you know, to make myself as palatable as possible to the masses that are, you know, being told that the way they need to consume stuff is through this very white male gaze. Um, it has been something that is extremely kind of isolating, but also a little discombobulating. And it has I don't know about you, I'll speak for myself. It has many times has me being like, am I, is it, bringing up the word futile again. It, am I, am I, am I crazy for being like, wait a second, I don't have to do that. Like, I know what that feels like in my body when I'm doing that kind of extractive, burn myself out, hustle myself to the bone. Like, I don't actually want to make a relationship with you, but I do want to see what can I get from you and what can you get from me and how can we do it in the most efficient way and how can we be the most profitable possible and like lose the human side of it all. Uh, that'd be great if we have it. That's like a nice to have. That's not the first most, you know, the, the most pressing priority that we have to actually flip that around. The amount, I always talk about this of like operating with your, um, the emergency brake on or being the person that's going against the, um, going against the, the crowd of just kind of having to move through that as you're like, I'm trying to build a business too, but still everything in front of me is telling me I should turn around and just do it the way everyone else has done it, even at the expense of what I know is my own humanity and other people's humanity. How, like, I, I love, first of all, who are you and how are you today? Perfect example. So for those of you who are listening that are managing teams or even just, you know, having dinner at, with your family, is there a possibility to start that way? I think is such an important tool to use. How else have you, um, have you seen kind of your relationship to success shift and change over time? I know as you were, you know, I know you've gone through this experience of fundraising and being non-white male founders in a space that really very much so, you know, the numbers are in the single digit percentage wise of non-white male founders getting funding. How have you kind of navigated that space and, you know, how does success change? And then the last element that I want to add to it is that you're creating a product that is not directed towards that VC space. You're creating a product that is intentionally like, I'm going to hold some space for people that have been historically excluded. How does that kind of show up as you're kind of navigating, building that business that you want to create your own kind of version of success there? At the beginning, I mentioned being a, a marketer for the first 15 years of my career, never fully fitting or liking that label. Um, definitely having to deal with the cognitive dissonance that comes with selling people things, right? And also being uh, really reflective in doing a lot of work and, and having my own philosophies about consumerism and capitalism. And so I bring that up because I'm not a stranger to living in con cognitive dissonance. Uh, I don't necessarily recommend it as a life path. It's a little stressful. Uh, not exactly the, the easiest route to go, but it has served me well in, in being prepared for this journey with Own Trail. Like I mentioned, Rebecca and I were really intentional from the beginning before we had even told our, our 
then tech day jobs that we were going to be starting this thing and moving to full time. Um, and I think so one thing that has been very helpful is knowing that this was the route we were choosing and intentionally choosing it saying like this might not be the easiest way but it's the way we're going to go and laying out some of the things that were non negotiables for us. Um, it is hard, though, because in with own trail we are existing in a system, not just the broader world right, but in the tech startup VC funding world that values growth above all costs, growth at all costs, zero sum games, right? The winner takes all, there can only be one. Um, and, and really hustle culture at its absolute hardest um, and saying, okay, cool, we're gonna participate in that system because it's going to fuel building something differently while also building a company and a product and a community that is very much creating revolutions on a daily within people in how they see themselves and how they see others and in how they're showing up for themselves and others. I like to say that own trail is a Trojan horse in a way that we are both participating in systems that are holding so many people back while proving to them that we can succeed using some of their metrics, right? That we can be a viable for-profit business that doesn't exploit people and that there's monetary value in that. And also that, so that shows them that there's a different way to do it that can tick some of their boxes while also creating a community of people who a lot of them are entrepreneurs in their own way, big companies, small companies, solopreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs, and even how people live their lives outside of what they do to make money. That's really the power of it is this, this idea that by us taking this harder road, me and me and my co-founder Rebecca and getting the rejections from VC funds, being um, non-white male, you know, um, well, non-male white founders um, and getting less than three or 2% of the fund of VC funding every year, um, depending on the year, like knowing that this was gonna be harder from the jump just based on our identities. Number two, knowing that this would be harder based on the fact that we're mission led. Number three, knowing it's harder because essentially we're waking people up or helping them not no we're not waking anybody up people don't need to be empowered the power is within them we're just clearing space for them to take it up for themselves and when they do that they're making other changes in their lives they're leaving the corporate job that's sucking them dry and giving them no purpose and working for companies that and with founders that fulfill them they're examining their own relationship to hustle culture they're examining you know, the relationships they have in their lives, the friendships that aren't serving them. And, and so long story long, it's hard, but I wouldn't trade it because it's this hard work that that's going to chip away at the bedrock of the, of the systems that have been pretty cemented in to our history since the beginning. But we also know behind the scenes, there's always been a web um, that has been society's net, right? When things fall apart, when a pandemic hits, Who's there to pick up the pieces? Well, what if we have that net that's both strong and flexible, nurturing, but also um, really powerful? How can we recenter the world on that instead of something that we know can break like man-made steel? Yeah, it's funny. I think of the 18 iterations of yourself that you mentioned before and the resilience that is built in those, the ability to kind of, whether it be to pivot, to start again on something, to re-examine, and how that makes the web even stronger when you've built that resilience behind the scenes that you don't even know what that strength and resilience is going to be for until an opportunity shows up and you're able to kind of move through it differently than you did the last time. Uh, and I think there is the thing, I don't know, as I was hearing you talk about this uh, Trojan horse nature of it all, one of the things that is so fascinating for me in the work that I do has been really around shining a light on the fact that we can lead differently, you know, and the marketer. So my background's in marketing as well. And the marketer in me of like using women's leadership, knowing that that can be something that is, is a problem for some folks, especially uh, I went to a school that was 70% dudes. So guys that felt like, wait, you're, so you, you, do you hate guys now? I'm like, no, that's not, that's not it. It's about 
actually talking about the idea of zero sum game and like that not being real. <laughs> the fact that we don't need to be transactional all the times. We don't need to be profitability focused all the time. We don't need to view ourselves as value and worth through our transactions with time and money. Like all of those pieces are things that actually benefit each and every one of us if we give ourselves the opportunity to open up our eyes to the, the belief and understanding that the world and humanity has existed outside of these structures that are so, I'll say extracting and are so like, it feels a little bit like a vampire of just sucking the life out of us. Um, and I love so very much that it's a, it's an experience of just individual proof points, you know, having each and every person have their own individual revolution, as you were talking about, whether it be from their 16th iteration of their trail, or it be in them sharing their trail with somebody else and hearing something back, or them having a conversation with a person they never would have met otherwise. There is so much power in witnessing the individual power that we have as the unique being that we were born into this world as. But I also love the idea that that web if we build our web in such a way, have the ability to actually turn the tide so the wave is not crashing against us, that that kind of allows us, each and every one of us, to kind of make that, <laughs> pull the gravity in a different direction. Um, though it can feel, it can feel very <laughs> exhausting in its own right. It can feel very disorienting, again, from all the external messages that we're getting that, like, no, you need to fall in line with this in order to be seen as a successful business person. But there is so much power in activating the individual in the power that they were born with to then hopefully create that shift. And so many, I will tell you, so many men in my life have reached out in like DMs or like what I've seen them and been like, I really like what you're doing, but I'm not allowed to say that because, you know, I got to bro out a little bit more, but also please do more of that. And oftentimes it's like, please do more of that for the women in my life. And I'm like, sure, I will. But also the reason that you're here saying this is that it actually resonated with you and that's okay. That doesn't make you any less of who you are to believe that it's okay to be more human centric and human first. Oh, I love that. And, and we could ask because Own Trail is intentionally women centered. And so we do have people being like, well, why not men? Not, we got that when we first launched and we're like, we're not saying that not men. You're hearing that when you say it's women centered, which- yeah. We can well that can be in its own onion we can we can examine the layers of um and there have been so you know people of all genders are welcome on own trail and we have we have you know like white straight cis men on there because it is valuable the tools that we're building are valuable and it's also valuable to be building it differently to be building it centered on women's experiences when so much of the world and of tech products especially social and community oriented ones have been built to be transactional, have been built around men's experiences. And so we're not doing it in a way that's countering, right? That's countering or opposing spaces that are that are male centered. It's a yes and. It's a way of balancing. Like what if we centered women's experiences in a new type of tool, in a new type of community? And how can that think about who we're centering in all the things that we're building? And it's really been quite incredible and, and affirming to hear from men that we've resonated with to be like, yeah, I get it. It's a women-centered space and I understand and, and will take up space as such. And um, for some of them, it's been, it's been a bit of a eye-opening to, a bit eye-opening to say like, oh, I've literally never thought about whether a place was not centered on me. This is my first experience. Of, part of choosing to participate in something and wanting to participate in something that actually wasn't designed with me in mind. That feels weird. And I had a couple calls with the, the, those men and like met them through our community and they've, they've been grateful about that. And so to be able to build a platform and tools that give everyone this ability to, to visualize, but most importantly, to navigate their lives, right? From this authentic space where we pull away, we peel back the layers of bullshit that we code ourselves in. Um, and to not have men support us because of their proximity to women, yep. that might be their first entry point. It's like, oh yeah, I'm married to a woman. This could be useful to her. Um, but to have champions and to have supporters in our, in our corner and members of our community who are like, I get this women need to take up space. You know, non-binary non people need to take up space. And also I can be, I can share space. I can hold space for them 
is really the, to me, what, what the future should look like. And, you know, I love so much. Oh God, there's so many things about that. It's like clutching my heart as you're talking because I'm like, Nikki, she's talking, don't interrupt. This is going through all these feelings. But the other part that I think, again, as you were talking about labeling and, you know, as marketers, we label as, uh, as human beings, we tend to categorize and that goes back to like caveman, cavewoman status of, you know, what's safe and what's a threat. But the idea that we can actually see things on a spectrum <laughs> that masculinity and femininity don't necessarily mean male and female. It doesn't necessarily mean man, woman, or non-binary that each and every one of us embody different elements along that spectrum. And it is safe to actually explore all aspects of yourself across that spectrum, then give permission for each of us to actually be those full humans that we are. Um, it's like, I, I love so much hearing that there are folks that are coming into this space being like, you know, it's uncomfortable for it not to be that like the red carpet has been rolled out from every aspect of who I am to be here. But, and also I want to be part of this because I want to use the power and privilege I have, but also I want to learn. And I want to learn as not the person that's saying, give me the microphone, let me tell you all the things I'm learning. I want to learn by witnessing and by supporting and by being part of a community uh, is so powerful. The other piece that keeps popping up, so I feel like I got this keeps happening sometimes when I get like, it's like, Nikki, come on, poking me in the back of the head. There is one of the things that was so fascinating to me, uh, feminine leadership models are really fascinating to me in general. Surprise, surprise. Uh, but reading about kind of historical collective leadership and having it be really feminine focused and having it be very much about the group and the collective and very collaborative. I loved how you were talking about building a space, especially in social media, that is kind of the antidote to the individualistic trend that a lot of our social media has gone to. And so really coming together as human beings in a collective that is tapping into more of uh, the biological, what I will, I, I, again, I'm not a biologist, like you were saying that earlier, but you know, I, uh, I remember going to a workshop that was talking about the fact, and even reading a book called Moody Bitches that talks a little bit about this, about how our, uh, how estrogen impact, estrogen and testosterone impact the way that our brains actually create neural pathways and that there are more kind of collaborative pathways, uh, the collaborative pathways get stunted when testosterone gets surged in, in utero or whatever we would call. Um, and so the idea that we actually allow for multiple experiences to be able to say, you know, we are meant to be connected beings as people, as a, as a human race, that is kind of how we survive is by banding together. Uh, instead of it being, let's be hyper-focused on our freedom and our individualism. And I love so much that it's like, if you want to explore it, but you're not really sure if you can kind of step fully into that space right now, you're also welcome here too. But here's how we operate here. And uh, giving that kind of permission and that invitation that hopefully then is like, in your conversations with other people in your life, you can be that Trojan horse. You can be that person that's kind of like, it's okay to be a person, you know, even if the world around you is telling you that you have to play a different part and you have to detach from your humanity, here is a place where you can actually be fully human. And that takes different forms. That can be that can be, sometimes it's, I, I like to call it the canary in the coal mine too. It's like, sometimes that can be the person being like, look, it's okay to talk about like pregnancy loss. Look, mm. it's okay to talk about burnout. Look, it's okay to talk about like how getting the promotion didn't fulfill you. Look, it's okay to talk about being the only fill in the blank in your, in your college program. Look, yeah. it's okay to talk about wanting to have a hundred K year, right? It's okay to say that you want to to buy your mama house. Like these things are okay to say. And so it doesn't have to be revolutionary in the sense of something that is polarizing or that is a hot button social or political issue, right? It's, it's giving yourself, by giving yourself permission to own your story and tell it in your terms, everyone who witnesses that can apply that to their own life, right? You're inviting them to, to give themselves the permission. And I love how you use the word witness. I think that that's, that's part and parcel with it. Um, with the experience and the value of what we're building with Own Trail, and there are other there are other companies building this way as uh, as well, and I think that that's absolutely necessary. It can't be just us. Um, we need to look at how we're building across different product types about you know all of these things because the systems extend everywhere. Um, and back to like the VC side of it, I'm sure that there are investors and 
you know, this hasn't been like a critique or a criticism or something we're under the microscope for, but coming and participating in this VC funded um, tech startup world, growth is amazing. They wanna see that growth as fast as possible, right? That's the, the traditional standalone success metric. And we've been intentional, which means a bit slower in growth. Number one, because it's all been organic. Um, and we're not paying for clicks. We're not padding the pockets of, of companies we don't believe, we don't, we don't align with. But also because establishing this baseline now is establishing this safe space for people to witness each other, for people to feel comfortable being witnessed um, and to show up as themselves, you know, who and how they are right then. And it's, it's paramount for us to have started with this foundation and not just because of my work background and Rebecca's work background, but for what we're building, it's absolutely critical that we have that foundation that we can then build upon. Otherwise, we're just adding noise. It's just another place where people are going to be spamming you with cold sales emails or trying to sell you things you don't want. And it's just more noise and like the world doesn't need that. I don't need that. Like it's busy enough. And so that's another place where it's a choice. It's a choice to say like, oh, do we go the path that is the traditional playbook of a growth, high growth potential startup of saying big, as big, as expansive as possible, as quickly as possible. Not at the expense, not at the sacrifice of building the thing that can have that impact for millions of people. If we don't get this foundational piece right, we can't change millions of lives. And I'm really excited for this next year at Own Trail, where we are poised for, for a lot more explosive growth on top of authenticity and safety. And um, we've never had to remove anyone from the platform. We've never had to, we've, we've never even had content flagged uh, for moderation because we've established the rules of engagement and not us putting it down people's throat. We've led by example with our trails and how our product is designed and, and the community there the community is the are the ones who have been like this is our space and if you're going to play here if you're going to take up space here if you're going to hold space here we're going to hold ourselves and each other accountable to have respect and to have interdependence and you know if you're there to, to exploit to be transactional it doesn't feel like the right place for you because it's not there are other places for that and that's great like you know, no shade to LinkedIn. LinkedIn is where you play the professional hits. Like, great. It, the purpose there is to elevate your career in an existing, usually corporate hierarchy. Like, play that game there. Like, they do their thing. They're great at it. That's not our, that's not our jam. Yeah. I, you know, I love this so much. And we, I feel like we'll be talking again and again, I hope. Uh, I, there is so much about this that I don't know where there's so much like water reference in my brain for this, but this wave that I keep feeling of the fact that we are experiencing a shift generationally of power and leadership. And uh, I do I do a whole workshop on this about millennial leadership and how millennial leadership is different inherently because of the experiences we've had, because of our, our makeup, the demographic makeup of our generation. Um, and so much is shifting Yes, there's a lot of pandemic orientation of how those shifts are happening, but the fact that there is a new baseline of what a foundational company can look like, what a company that is actually going to be successful looks like, it doesn't necessarily need, need to be the 15, uh, the overnight fame, the 15 minutes, is, is get as much as you can out of your 15 minutes. It can be, let's build that foundation. So when the time is here, because you know the time is, <laughs> I will say in the work that you're doing, in the work that I'm doing, I feel like initially it was like, you're an outlaw. What are you talking about? Like, that's great. Like, okay, maybe that doesn't feel good for you. And then also in the last three years, the world has shifted so much that the conversations that were kind of the whisper conversations had behind the scenes are now being had at full volume on the floor of the Senate, you know? And so creating these spaces where when, when the business world is ready, when people are ready to interact this way, that we've been here, we have created this foundation. And yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't always easy, but like, this is the future we saw, even if you thought we were crazy for thinking it was there, we've still kind of helped, we've still kept the light on. Um, so you're still welcome to be here. And so I'm just so grateful for that. I am amped to bear witness to own trails next year. Oh my goodness. Um, and I, is there anything else that you want to share with the audience? 
I, your, all your socials and everything, we will make sure if you, again, if you listen to this and you listen to the conversation with Rebecca and you don't have an own trail, please go get one, <laughs> go do it. It's super easy. Yes. And it's fun and uh, connect with me after, after you've done it. I'd love to, um, fun fact for those of you who have an own trail or have a trail and own trail. And for those of you who are making one, if you get an appreciation, which is our version of a, of a non-toxic lake right? It's not like a counter. Nobody can see how many times your trail has been appreciated. It's, you can't win. You can't, you can't be like, oh, I'm an influencer um, yeah. um, in that regard here. But if Rebecca or I appreciate your trail, like that's not an automated function. We literally read through the trails and are like, wow. And we manually, we click that button. So if you get an appreciation for us, fun fact, that's actually really us looking at it, feeling those vibes. Yes. Um, and I love the water analogy that you brought up and it makes me think about what made own trail this, this idea that I couldn't walk away from when Rebecca first told me about it. It was this ripple effect, right? Like if each of us are, are one ripple that we can have feels small, but what you just described is happening is all of those ripples are forming multiple waves that are creating a tidal wave that are creating sea change and creating your trail and own trail and participating in this ecosystem in this community is one way of joining that movement. And I would love to have all of your amazing audience and as a part of that, because I adore having you as part of that community. And if this conversation was your jam, then you are gonna love the ones you can have there. Um, because it's all, it's, you know, it's all very much like it ebbs and flows. Like we're not gonna try to keep you spending your, uh, like spending all of your time on a website. Like great, meet amazing people like Nikki and have amazing conversations on a podcast or meet a friend that you have Zoom, you know, like that you find a collaboration with. Like that's really the fruit of the work is seeding these com conversations, opening ourselves up to possibilities, seeing what we've already accomplished and like what we're capable of individually and of each other. And this was just a delight. I could, I could talk to you all week. Let's just do that. Can we just clear our schedules and just figure out how to fix the world? <laughs> Yeah, we will do that. Yeah, Great. we'll get back to everyone in March. Yes, <laughs> we will. We will report back to you all. Um, thank you. Honestly, I, this was such a delight. See, I didn't oversell in the beginning. I didn't sell, oversell in the beginning when I said this is going to be such a good conversation. Katie, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so grateful for you and for Rebecca and Own Trail. You've made my day. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you. What did I tell you? Didn't I tell you Katie is amazing? They brought it. They brought all the gems and the little nuggets of wisdom that didn't seem like they were going to blow your mind until after they shared them. And then you're like, whoa, what just happened? Yep, that's Katie. I got off my conversation and I was smiling from ear to ear all day, all day. So if you are a person that listened to that and thought about the ripples in your life that have turned to waves that have really shifted the tide, that is an amazing, amazing place to be because really understanding that you alone in being who you are can be that ripple that turns into the wave that shifts the tide for those around you, for the collective, and also to move us towards that future where it is all about us bucking all the oppressive systems and all the things that tell us we are not enough as we are and leaning towards that idea that you are intended to be uniquely you. I cannot wait to hear what you thought of this episode, so please, please, please let us know. Please feel free to reach out over on NikkiInnocent.com or reach out to us on social media. I know that Katie will be so amped to hear how this conversation went. And if you're not already a part of Own Trail and you've listened to this conversation and maybe the conversation with Katie's co-founder, Rebecca, please join us over on Own Trail and connect with me. I've got a profile over there. All right, my friends, I hope you have a wonderful day ahead and I will catch you on the next episode.